Got it. Okay. And maybe maybe I'll just give an introduction here. Yeah, I, I am uh, Andres Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I'm with Aslam Kakarl of uh, the Pashtun Studies Institute. Uh, we met in Oneonta, New York, and uh, at the Let Me Think Scholarship Workshop. And we're talking about the ways of figuring things out in sociology. Uh, Aslam Kakarl is a PhD candidate of global affairs, soon defending his thesis. And so uh, it's uh, he's actually a sociologist uh, by, by skill set. And so it's a uh, very uh, great to try to see if we could have a sociology study group to, uh, together. In particular, uh, this wondrous wisdom uh, that I've been developing all my life uh, uh, is something that I'm trying to um, see, like, what, what could it be applicable in sociology? So leaning heavily on Islam to see that. And so what I'll do today is I, I sketched out a uh, diagram of 24 ways of figuring things out in sociology. <laughs> Very tentative because of my limited knowledge. So, uh, but uh, Aslam, welcome. Hi. Hi, Andreas. Thank you so much. Uh, this is um, such a kind introduction. And I uh yeah you know as you know i i was really looking forward to this conversation and i've enjoyed our conversations in the past and what you said wondrous wisdom i just took note of that that's that's a beautiful uh concept and hopefully one day we can talk about that too but you know uh so i read the letter and mm -hmm. i have some thoughts but i think before we do that i would really like you to explain the diagram to me i think that if 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 that's okay. Yes, I'd like to do that. So I'd like to present it uh, briefly. Um, you can see there's 24 labels here that I've organized, and this is uh, something uh, that I've been doing for since 2010, I think. So that was maybe 13 years ago. Taking a discipline, I started with my own uh, wondrous wisdom, my own philosophy, and you know wrote down, let's say, 200 ways I had figured things out. And then I classified them looking for patterns. I found uh, 24 patterns that systematize. And when you look at the system, I find it very beautiful. Um, and it has uh, these building blocks that are recurring in this language of uh, cognitive frameworks, which I call wondrous wisdom. So I have done this maybe for um, different disciplines, including mathematics, uh, physics, uh, neuroscience, biology, uh, for personalities like uh, Jesus or um, the Jewish sage, the Gaon of Vilna. And uh, in each case, uh, if you have a if you have a discipline, like a scientific discipline, you will have some kind of observer that's presumed. If you look at the people who are experts at this discipline, how they figure things out, you will see how they think in terms of that observer, and you'll be able to systematize. You get the same epistemological system, at least I do. That's what I'm trying to um, check with others. Uh, but um, Kirby Erner said very nicely, he he was very skeptical of it in the beginning, but I think I showed him the one for biology. He became quite uh, enamored. He calls it like a cheat sheet. So like if you were writing a textbook you know, for a subject, this is something you might put on the back cover uh, just so that you could quickly overview it. I think it's uh, it's kind of a, uh, something you can put together. I put this together in a couple of days, um, mostly based on the Wikipedia article of um, about sociology. So they have a methodology section. So they had maybe like 10 or 12 methods, and I actually guessed what the other ones should be. Um, so this can be very wrong, but uh, but but I think it's, uh, I, I'm glad how it came out. And Kirby Erner, um, mentioned that these are kind of like the theater of the mind. So when we look at a discipline, there's certain ways of figuring things out. This is kind of like the audience in the dark, this bottom part. And this would be like the thing on the stage. So there's a certain things that once you have a system well-defined, then you can use all kinds of sociological methods in an algebraic way. You know, you could do a survey, you could go in the archives, you can put together different things because it's all like a system exists. But there's this like audience sitting in the dark, like before you get this stage of sociology, you have to kind of build up to it. You have to have a certain um, 
uh, you have to have certain preconditions. So I just want to say, uh, Aslam, what's going to happen is that like in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to be knocked off and then I'll we will, we'll probably have to take like a 10 minute break, I think. And then we'll resume after 10 minutes, hopefully if you have time. But anyways, uh, so when I, you, you just yes. use the same link. Ne next time, uh, well, I'll, uh, I think I have the institutional. Uh, oh, and uh, you don't have these limitations, right? Yeah. So next time I'll create the link. Okay. So then let me walk through this. Um, it turns out, uh, and this is based on these methods I, I took from Wikipedia and I kind of, place them in this table. Um, but I would say that the crucial uh, way of figuring things out in sociology is determining somebody's self-identity, you see. Uh, sociology is a very tricky uh, science, I think, because in a certain sense, it's not because the observer, let's see, how does this work? The observer is kind of defining themselves. It's all about you know the observer who is working out their self-identity. So it just leaves sociology very much um, fluid. You know, like what, it, and so in a certain sense, I get the impression that it's very difficult for sociology to come up with any real conclusions about anything. It can have all kinds of conceptual systems and build them up in explanatory, you know, positions. But those are all, first of all, on a case-by-case -case basis. And second of all, they're just very um, tentative or just, they're just very kind of like, uh, uh, they're, they're just very uh, imagined, basically. <laughs> like, so something like Marx, Marxian uh, analysis. Well, Marx had a lot of uh, deep ideas, uh, you know, uh, maybe important ideas, but it's never really going to be the only way of looking at things. And it'll always be kind of skeptical, you know, that, that that's, it's not really talking about reality. It's it's just giving a picture. So sociology is great for writing essays and, you know, doing political rhetoric and kind of giving interpretations, but it's actually giving you kind of like laws of sociology practically never, it seems. But the exception would be like, there's a very tricky question of like, well, and a very important question, like, well, how do you determine self-identity? Because sociology is talking about this collective as if it was like a social spirit, you know? And how do you talk about the spirit, which is imaginary in a certain sense, but, you know, seems to have real consequences. And, and you know, so it's, it's about these subdivisions, you know, that there are these classes or genders or nations or however you want to carve it up but that the, the whole is being carved up into different things, which are subspirits of the spirit, right? And how is this all, it's all kind of imaginary. So a crucial thing there is that, well, how does the individual come into play? And so who do they identify with? You know, do they really identify with a class? Do they really identify with a nation? Who are they really, do they identify with their gender? You know, who are they really identifying with? In a certain sense, that's very important. And the problem is that, uh, it's very difficult to find out. You know, first of all, their level of awareness is 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 can be varied, but second of all, like if you have different governments occupying a territory at different times, and they ask people, let's say, well, who are you, right? Well, it's going to depend a lot on who asks, and so what sociology can do, maybe at its best, is to help us figure out, like, well, how do you answer a question like that? You know, how do you actually approach a person and really get to know how they really think of themselves in deed or in word or in, you know, in self-identity? I would think that that's something that sociology could really uh, be uh, helpful in a real sense as a real science. And a lot of, and the idea is that a lot of things come from that. So in the, in the end, what will, so we have to build up to that, an individual in a social context. But once we have that, there will be four different ways of thinking about that individual. I mean, one is that an individual is all the ways they are documented. You know, so they, they're expressed by them. See, that's not really the individual. That's just an image of the individual, right? Behind that, there's some kind of individual will who's acting, right? But what we get to see, we get to see a bunch of documented information. Then from the government's or the authority's point of view, that individual is something that gets classified. So they have their old like you know taxonomy of classification, which is how they want to look at somebody, right? And then another way is to say, well, scientifically, 
is not really individuals. There's all these subgroups that are somehow ideal subgroups, and somebody's going to belong to a bunch of different subgroups. So the idea is that there's these different four things. And the reason I kind of, um, so this is just a general thing that happens, but you get pairs of these things. So like if you take a survey, what's a survey doing? It's saying, okay, somebody gave a bunch of answers. That's their documentation. But the point of the survey is to see what it tells you about an intersection of some kind of ideal subgroups. And so it's somehow connecting these two. Whereas like maybe archival information would say, okay, here's a person who was classified by an actual authority, you know, not some neutral scientist order, but some, you know, some particular government has a relationship with individuals. It's classifying them for its own purposes. But those individuals, you can actually see, oh, they have documented lives. So an archive will help you make that connection. But whereas like a longitudinal study would help you see, oh, and this is a preliminary, but the idea is that, you know, there's actual people there. And if you trace people's life, how they're documented, you can actually see that they made different choices or different things happened to them or they had different lives, right? Then um, maybe you would have, um, you know, so I just made these up, but like a census is something that may say, okay, how does the government deal, you know, with the sociological question of like, oh, how do you classify, you know, these different subgroups, you know, so the government is trying to take that role as if it was a neutral party, let's say, right? So the census is huge time. Uh, you can do social network analysis. So that would say, okay, these different uh, subgroups, like how does they manifest through particular people? You know, they're there, let's say, I think there was an example of, um, well, like this kind of, um, uh, analyzing a person's whole kinship network, uh, or like there was a, an example uh, from this wonderful book, uh, Social Theory, a basic toolkit, um, about uh, someone who was in a ghetto environment um, uh, in a distraught uh, neighborhood and how they relied on a whole network of people. So that would be like a network analysis on different people. And let's say their question, like, do they give up that network um, for the sake of some kind of stable independent life or not what's the what's the possible choice in, involved in that and then another would be let's say um you have these classes of individual but you could like do a comparative analysis so you could say well like neighboring countries or uh, neighboring communities or neighboring you know just different castes in a caste system like how do they how do things play out so once you have a sociology like once you have a sense of the individual their relationship with society you can do that but how do you build up to that there's a lot that you need to do to build up to that. So one of it is ethnographical, and then one would be like more like economics. But the very first thing, in order to start as a sociologist, you have to, kind of like you gave me a very interesting personal story, you have to do this, you have to have a personal life, and hopefully you document it, you know, in different ways. You basically, like I saw a very nice, in Wikipedia, there was a nice recommendation, like a sociologist should really have a diary. And why is that? Because if they, I would say, like, if they don't have their own self-identity, right? If they don't look at themselves as a, as an instrument of sociology, how could they possibly uh, be really good at um, seeing that in other people? So the first step is to be maybe an active citizen, but certainly an active observer, where you record, you know, you take to heart different things that happen to you in society. You think about them and, you know, you write about them. And the reason it's said in Wikipedia is that so that later you could see your own biases. That's very important. But I know that like you're a poet. I think poetry can serve, serve a very similar function. Uh, someone could be a journalist. They could be writing reports as a journalist. Something that they could look back on. Now, um, there's two things. In order to build up a notion of a society, there's two things that need to be done. One is like ethnographic. So you can do a, lots of documentation just as an outside observer. But at a certain point, you would also want to do like um, personal observation as an insider. You'd want to be included like anthropologically as somebody who is, uh, you know, going through similar things, let's say. I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom because of all the interesting content and all the interesting minds I get to participate with. Sign up, it's easy. So after personal observation, which is uh, very important in terms of interpreting uh, what's happening, then there's important to have codification. And this is, I think, what grounded uh, theory is all about. But 
to create some kind of conceptual language based on all these uh, observations. And so then that uh, kind of gives some kind of meaning that's uh, relevant to that. So this whole language comes. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence for these three different types of ways of figuring things out. But I think that there should also be like a fourth one that once you've codified things, it's important to rank them. You know, so for example, let's say you're doing a study of a village market and then you say, oh, well, there's different kinds of stalls. There's different kinds of vendors. You'll say there's clothing and there's food. You know, so that's kind of an arbitrary choice. But then you'll make evaluations in terms of saying, well, okay, which one is more important or which one is more characteristic or which one is more uh, like the same like with artworks. You can be looking at ceramic vases and you have to say, well, which example is really more valuable or more interesting or more important uh, so with all these things. So there'll be this ranking. And so the whole point of this is that you're collecting this huge uh, documentation of a society and evaluating it, but from an external point of view, from an outside, from, from a quote unquote objective point of view. But that's, and so that would be ethnography. But what economics is doing is saying, okay, but what do people value um, themselves just internally? You know, and how do they behave based on those values? So I don't really have any evidence for this, but this is just based on like as a, my scientific instincts. And this is in analogy with biology. So like in biology, you would similarly have two uh, wings to this one where you would take a organism and you would um, consider it in its nature. And then you would consider taking it out in vitro, as it's called, like in glass. And then you would try to have a... Uh, in vivo, you try to maybe have an aquarium or terrarium for it, and then you would put it back in nature. So you have this notion of a of this uh, individual. But on the other hand, you may do experiments to see, like, how can we change the environment to, to make it visible or to kill it or to have homeostasis or have it transcend that homeostasis. So similarly, there should be a way of controlling the environment and seeing what happens uh, and how that reflects individuals' values. So the first is just to give people freedom. And that might just be giving them more freedom. Like, let's say you give them a tax break. What happens to that tax break? Or you give them, there's a new holiday like Juneteenth. How do people spend that holiday? That'll show people's values. Another is to, um, or it could be a technological innovation, for example. Another would be to have a new constraint. So it could be like a new tax uh, or a new law that forces them um, to, uh, and so you get deviant behavior, for example, because of these, let's say, laws. Another would be to give them assistance to overcome a hurdle. And then the last one uh, would be, I think, uh, would be, okay, under the right conditions, like what are the right conditions where they start to organize themselves? And how does that self-organization proceed? So this is just entirely guesswork. <laughs> but the idea is that something like that, and this is similar to, I think, like economics. Uh, so saying if we have ethnographic documentation, but we'd also want some kind of like economic theory uh, you know, data. And now how are they related? The idea is that there's this three cycle, this learning cycle that relates them. Uh, and it's, uh, so in the, in the wondrous wisdom, you'd have this three cycle, like you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect, it's like the scientific method. And so this is a very important three cycle, but in sociology, I think it's based on policy. So really like, um, uh, Governing society is how you learn a lot about in sociology. And so one step is you define a policy. So you can learn things just by having to formulate a policy. You can work out a lot of logic, you know, that what, what's going to have to be involved just by defining policy or improving a policy, etc. Then you intervene with the policy. So just putting it into practice, uh, you know, doing an intervention uh, will you'll learn that. But then evaluating it, stepping back. So governing society through policy is a way of linking this ethnographic understanding that's external, but with the economic uh, reality of what are people's internal values. And so pulling that all together, um, it grounds this notion of self-identity, that there are participants in society and they have a self-knowledge with regards to their position in society. And so when we think of the spirit of society, it's somehow very much rooted in these people's self-identity. 
But in practice, when you try to observe that, you're going to look at people in four different very ways. So like whether they are experiencing something as individual actors, how they're behaving, but like what they experienced will be like, you can see it in what was documented and maybe how they experienced it in terms of this whole system of classification from above and why they experienced it would be like the sociological theory based on the subgroups they belong to. You, This is trying to explain it. Let's say that this is just a kind of like a tentative theory theory and so you get all these you get these uh, visualizations so i put here like evolution would be like a tree reorganized with a sequence or a handbook would be like a sequence reorganized with a network or a chronicle would be like for time you'd have a time sequence reorganized with a tree a catalog would be a tree reorganized with the network links uh, an atlas would be a network reorganized with a tree an odyssey, like you're walking through a social network, would be, let's say, you know, be like the social mobility or the changes or whatever. Or maybe like, for example, children moving from one family to another. But you have a, a network um, um, with uh, reorganized the sequence. So these are ways that these different methods are kind of like applying them, you know, kind of like being organized around. And then if you take them all, you have this whole system uh, you have this whole systematized uh, picture of society, then you can actually model society with, let's say, computer simulations and things like that. So the most important is determining self-identity. Uh, the, the beginning would be like, you know, being an instrument of sociology, having a diary, and then finally being able to do some kind of simulations. Um, this is a this is what I was able to uh, think in terms of how we figure things out in sociology, how sociologists figure things out. And what does that imply about what sociology is? Wow, that is that is so fascinating. So the way you read uh, the the diagram is from below. From so bottom so up is basically how I read it, right? Okay, okay. Or like Kirby said, like you know, this is a stage. So once it's all systematized, it's like a stage where the science is taking place. But there's like this audience, you know, in the dark, let's say, right? But there's all these presumptions about the audience, you know, that like, well, we've collected all this, you know, knowledge about the society. You know, we're not sitting in a in a in a vacuum, you know, we're and we have all this evidence. And then we can building on this, you know, we have an observer who is this uh um like, like in the case of biology, the observer would be, well, the observer needs to be able to look at an ecosystem and see how an ecosystem changed uh, because you introduced, let's say, a new organism. So like you brought rabbits to Australia, how did the ecosystem change? Well, so the biological observer has to be able to see the difference in ecosystems. So the sociological observer, I guess, would have to be able to somehow see the difference um, what happens when people's uh, self-identity, I guess, when they, when it uh, changes, let's say, right? So a, a classic example could be like what's happening in Ukraine, right? So how is Ukraine changing because of the war, right? How is Ukrainian self-identity changing? So right. um, you need to be able to see the difference in how people... Um, yeah, I guess in terms of how they think of themselves, it's a crucial thing. So the crucial observe the observer needs to be able to be the person who can listen to the Ukrainian. The sociology, the perfect you know sociological observer is the one who can get into the heart and mind of this of the you know and will of the Ukrainian. And say, well, this is really you know how you're changing you know in general as right. people, individually and collectively as people. Let's say right. And some of these, and it's it's super interesting. I mean, I think. One aspect of this uh, attempt at understanding the individual and the collectivity is, uh, of course, so for example, in the case of Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, this, you know, this is a pretty recent phenomenon. And so things are shifting. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk to Ukrainians now and uh, what they are, uh, thinking who they are and I, I mean yeah I think you, one can understand some aspect but then it's also like do they really understand 
themselves. You know, I think that that's yeah. the other aspect, right? Do they really know what is going on in their own selves? Um, and I think as, so. That's that's I what this suggests. And you know, I, I'm just excited that um, I did this in two days. You know, more or less. So <laughs> to be able to take a discipline I don't really know much about, you know, really, I, I have no expertise in be able to say, okay, I have this. And I feel I could present this well to you as a sociologist and, and not be left off the face of the earth. So it shows that there's some kind of power to these structures. And I think some kind of reality to these structures, first of all, but then in terms of the, what it, it gives interesting answers to say, Hey, like the thing that's really scientific about um, sociology is can it reach into these people's self-identity and help them sort it out? You know, because they themselves, like you're saying, how, do they really know, you know, what it means to be Ukrainian and are they really Ukrainian? And, you know, how could you tell? So um, how can you ask them so that they really give the answers that maybe are most um, relevant? How can you see it in their actions? Right. Um, right. I think the, I, I mean, of course, uh, there is, so much that uh, has been written and do i claim to know all of it no of course mm -hmm. i mean i'm aware of the literature so for example the classical sociological theory right marx weber smith mm -hmm. uh, Durkheim, uh, norbert elias the guy who worked on civilization and the civilizing process um, and and so many more. I mean, the, in the contemporary sociological theory. Um, uh, so so coming to uh, the the point of like individual self identity. What is what is identity? Right, like the two dimensions: the social mm -hmm. dimension, the personal dimension. I think it was the British sociologist uh, Harbert Mead who developed the theory of me and I. Mm. Me and I is, you know, in grammatical ter terms is so me will be would be the object, the oh. passive, mm -hmm. the passive self. So so the self that um, is being acted upon uh, by um, by circumstances, by conditions external to the self. And uh, then there is I, I is the active self, the subject self, which acts. And so, you know, I think there is I and me, I think we, we are in a constant state of negotiation and renegotiation mm -hmm. as when it comes to this personal and societal, social dimension or societal dimension, right? So, uh uh, the, I think the important distinction is that I, you know, like who I am, uh, you know, I, I define myself a certain way mm -hmm. as I, I am Islam, I am a sociologist, I am, I think, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but then there is, but that, that would be the personal dimension, right? But then there is the social dimension, how I relate to others, how do I conduct myself like for example today this guy with this guy right right probably I could have been like less of i <laughs> you know <laughs> what? Just, you know so 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 me is shaped by the well me shapes i in a lot of different ways which is the passive self, right? Like how much of, I mean, there is also this negotiation of like, how much of I do I want to let go? How much of me do I want to accept? Um, you know, uh, because- like we, like we were can... talking about like um, being willing to give up some of your honor for the sake of just uh, avoiding confrontation, right? Like, so in certain societies, like um, that would be in uh, many societies, you know, that's problematic in the sense that that may be your currency. Like if you back down, right, then it's like, well, then what are you worth as an individual, right? Like Very how true. can you be trusted if you don't even care about your own dignity, so to speak? Yeah. But on the other hand, like from a more cosmic sense, there's a lot of law. Like that's a way that you show that you're a cosmic being. You say, look, I don't. I'm not going to fight over these little things, right? Like, I don't need to, I can just step out. 
right? Exactly. You're right. Yeah. And I and I did that many times at the scholarship workshop we were there. I mean, it was, you know, I just said, you know, I just roll out. I I fall out. I don't play. You know, I just will not participate. In this I will not be a subject of human subject research. You know, not because I'm critical of this, but just I have the right not to be. You know, I I don't have to be part of this. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so this, I think my point was that that sociologists have come up with these very interesting frameworks you know, or, you know, ways of like probably understanding the individual and identity. And, you know, so some, I don't know who said that identity really is a, is, is a, is a script, is the performance of script, right? Uh, that, that we perform when, when we identify ourselves, we are basically performing a script. So you perform... Mm -hmm. Oh, I just want to maybe show that, you know, or suggest, like just thinking about this diagram, what it says about the I and the me. And I think hmm. it relates to this uh, performance of the script. I think the self-identity switches them around because like both sides of this, uh, you know, in this, both sides here relate the I and the me, but you, they end up switching it around. So when you describe a society, right, externally, yeah. It's looking at people as me, right? In a certain sense, because, you know, but a lot of times these cultural things are things that people identify with, right? Like this, 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 this is my culture, right? Like this is who I am, right? Yeah. I am Pashtun, I'm Lithuanian, you know, I am a, you know, I am a uh, subway, you know, driver or whatever. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the head of a household, but, but, a lot of these, well, they're also like me. I mean, you know, this is saying, well, what happens to me when under different circumstances? But this reveals a lot of like who I actually am, right? Like, and so, you know, like if you really want to see who a person actually is, like you give them their freedom, right? This is who they actually are. Um, and so in a certain sense, it's it's really more of the I, right? Hmm. But but somehow when we determine self-identity, like it gets kind of, uh, it seems to switch, be switched over, right? Like, so this is in a certain sense, it's really looking at somebody as an I, but, but it's treating them as if they were me, you know, and here it's kind of treating them as if they're me, but they end up taking it as if it was I, you know, they would explain like most people, most people would not define themselves based on what they do with their extra money, right? That's just not how they would think about themselves. Um, but it's but in a certain sense, it's very real. Like they may think more of themselves in terms of well, where they, you know, how they fit in or whatever. I don't know. It's hard to say. But so somehow, but yeah. it may be that it may be that this performance, there's this role of performance, and the role of performance kind of switches things around. So like I becomes me and me becomes I. I don't know. I think that is, yeah, and, and that's a that's a that's a really good point. Um I think the other thing is also like I, where does the I come from? As mm -hmm. you said, right, like culture and nationality and the ways of living and the identification, like how much of these things that we would normally identify or classify as like me, as passive, as external mm -hmm. to the I, shape the I itself? Mm-hmm. Like, like when, when, when you say, oh, I'm, you know, I as the subject, I as the actor, I as the agent, uh, isn't necessarily free or like, it's not a free given. It's not value free entity. It's, it, it itself is, I think, uh, shaped by, you know, the by socialization, by education, by well, and so it's like, how much do we buy into these things, right? Like, so you know, I exactly. like buying into our job, like that my job identifies me. Well, does it, you know, I mean, does it have to? And so, I think with each person, it's a little bit different. And so, the amount of buy in that we have in, ter in terms of the different places that we are in society, whatever, this notion of a spirit of society is very much related to that. Like, so, you know, like, 
is somebody a, do they relate to the working class let's say right do they relate to let's say the proletariat right like well it's it's not clear you know but on the other hand like um if if they feel that hey i am treated this way you know i am um i i, I am a i i get less wages than i deserve you know and uh, i need to fight for my wages then all of a sudden it they are the proletariat let's say right in some sense so well, how does that you know how does that happen how does somebody you know become identified with uh, with a class or act on that because but there's something kind of like uh, christ-like or i don't know how to say it in islam or other things but like to let go of that to say you know i don't have to i don't have to uh live by you know like you said i belong to the republic of imagination right <laughs> so i love that that that's that's our uh, country, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then what uh, happens to the spirit of society? Right? I mean, it just seems to kind of crumble when the when it is. Well, when you don't play along, like when you don't uh, have that yeah. argument with the person who is just having an argument to be me, right? You just say, "Well, you you win." <laughs> so then you just let go. You know, like, you what is there to cling yeah. to, right? Like, you can have Pakistan, you can have, you know, this, you can have that. You can have Islam and you can have... Yeah, um, just all that, like that. Like, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's just... Um, I don't know how to... I think... I mean, the... the saying things like i've studied all religion well well he actually works in pharma or something and claiming that he knows it all that he is and then it's just that's mm -hmm. just another it's just so pathological it's just something else you know it, i think even and i think that leveraging you know of these whole things like you know this is all based like authority is based on typically on uh you know where you are coded into the system right like you know that you have yeah exactly and, exactly and there's something kind of cool about america where there's there's merit given to how you're able to you know what you've done with your life so or you know what you're doing with the choices you're making right like you know that you're somehow able to be measured i think that there's something um it's a beautiful thing oh that is a beautiful thing i think I think, I mean, of course, see, I mean, one of one of the problems is this individual and, you know, cases, individual cases and making mm -hmm. generalizations because that's one runs into trouble with that. But, but I would say, I think an American like someone wouldn't probably, I mean, probably this guy is also an American. I mean, it's now he's an American. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. just, some, some just don't, I mean, like one has to be humble, right? Like uh, what uh, the um, Brazilian educator said: critical epistemological curiosity, mm -hmm. right? That that you you one has to have that. And um, but anyways, this guy was just a loser, basically. But so what this says, you know, and if. So the schema, first of all, could just be totally wrong, you know, but but I like it. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, you seem to be supportive uh, that. Um, but just one example, like of what it starts to say, then it starts to say that there's objective measures of looking at different cultures and seeing, well, how are they functioning? And so a culture where there's a lots of self-organization happening uh, is, I think, um, is a transcendent culture and so like when you look at a culture like america where i would say more than half the adults um have positions of leadership you know or responsibility like where they're in, they're the boss on some matter right like they're the authority on some issue or they're, they're the ones who have control over some question right like it's a huge amount of people like you look at the businesses you look within the businesses you look within um just you know the organizations right like many many people are in charge of something right um, which is maybe not true in other societies. Uh, or also, like, for example, I just know as a Lithuanian um, American, I grew up, uh, this whole world of Lithuanians in America with their own institutions and organizations able to kind of uh, 
fund themselves and you know support themselves it's just amazing uh, that that can take place and so uh, right. there you know any culture where things like that are happening i think is uh, remarkable culture uh, well, or or question. or like people being able to i think this also says like you know being able to make your own families uh, have different kinds of families have different kinds of solutions right like in a culture where you have that uh, self initiative it's somehow um, there's something beautiful about that, as opposed to a culture where that is all decided, you know, uh, uh, externally. Let's say, right? That yeah. that's missing out. I think that's what, see. So this is a not a um, relativistic uh, framework. It's saying that um, it's making it, it's saying that there's certain um, bases for seeing well to uh, evaluating culture. Yeah, and, and that, that's a really, I want to uh, address this point, you know, this um, sociologist or psych, um, uh, social psychologist, so mm -hmm. social, those who social uh, psychology, I mean, experts in social psychology and they, and sociologists too, they talk about two types of cultures. Mm -hmm like the ideal Weber's ideal type, right? So mm -hmm. one is the idea of uh, tight culture mm -hmm. and the other is loose culture. So tight culture is culture where there is uh, less room for experimentation uh, of any sort. Let's say, you know, questioning as I... Mm -hmm started our conversation with, um, you know, challenging, you you know, the norms, the traditions, and the mm -hmm. way you think about life and the conception of the good life and whatever, right? So you, it, there is a tendency to conform to whatever mm -hmm. exists. Um, and and so, so, so the good thing about tight culture then is that there is, of course, the less or restrictions on creativity mm -hmm. innovation but there is stability and predictability so if you belong to a family and you know there are certain you're the beneficiary because like i'll give you the Pakistan, example of pakistan so you grow up I mean, things are, again, of course, nothing remains static and especially mm -hmm. society, things change. But for the most part, you know, you, you, you know, as a, as a boy, as a kid, you grow up and you become an adult and the family supports you. If they have money and you go to school, you go to college, you go to university, they get, you get engaged, you get married and mm -hmm. like your brothers, and sisters and, you know, even cousins and uncles and father, they all support. They even like, build you a room and like you know mm -hmm. so 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 that is that so you you are the beneficiary of the system right mm -hmm. so then you as an individual cannot just come and tell them oh you know what i'm um i'm doing this thing or that thing like right. it just doesn't fit in because uh you know, uh, I think another way to look at this is communitarianism, right? The, this whole communitarian philosophy. Um, Michael Sandale has a good book, uh, Justice, What is the Right Thing to Do? He's a communitarian. Mm -hmm. so, so the individual in that sense doesn't fall from the sky. You know, you're born into a place, into a family which raises you, which gave you all these things, you know, and took care of you. And then comes a point where you're like, okay, now, I, now I'm good. So you mm -hmm. see... Um, so there is the, the predictability and the stability. Uh, I mean by those two words that you will have a system to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Even like arranged marriages, like there is a risk, but there is also safety in that. So you don't really experiment with it. Like love, you know, for example, you fall in love, you fall out of love, you fall in like, I mean, it's a good thing, but there is also right. the instability aspect of it, right? I mean, the pain, the pain that comes with experimentation. So I think, you know, of course, and I have a particular biases because of the way I grew up in, you know, in, uh, in Western cultures, etc. I'm not. And, and, but, but I want to, but I want to say that, um, 
uh, to be critical of this whole thing, you know, in the simplest uh, way is just to say, uh, you know, half of these methods I made up, you know, like this whole economic side, it could be just wrong. So the, one of the things is like, if we could work together and try to find more examples, like to say, what are sociologists really doing? then this would become much more precise and maybe this would look foolish uh, parts of this, you know, so is there really, do they really look for self-organization or not? I don't know, but whatever they're looking for is what would be the guide. Um, but, and then also like what is meant by self-organization? So, but I think what it would be meant is like, um, like in a culture where you have, let's say arranged marriages, it may open up all kinds of things, um, because it may be, it may relax certain things, you know, so people may cool. be able to, uh, like, let's say women may be able to um, just uh, have more opportunities in some certain, in some sense, because of arranged marriages. So I don't know, it would depend on the particular culture and how it's, uh, you know, how it really works out. But that would be the question, like, you know, if you gain security, does that open up more uh, opportunities for self-organization? You know, let's say we're all the, so for example, if you have a, um, culture where genders have uh, separate activities, right? Like men can do things together and women do things. Well, on, on the one hand, that whole distinction is enriching in a certain sense, because it means that you have more things going on, right? Like you have these new identities that are able to meet together. You have these genders that have meaning, right? So that's not uh, limiting self-organization, that's increasing, I would think, self-organization. And so in a culture where you have arranged marriages, you know, maybe you have more of these distinctions. Maybe that's a good thing. You know, I don't know. But um, so but so one way to look at this is, you know, to collect more examples, to get like a more a conceptually clear uh, picture of like, well, what what are sociologists? Um, how are they figuring things out? What are the methods they use? And that really will teach us what is society and what you know, how to look at society. Sure, yes. Um, I think so. I want to say a couple of things. Uh, I was not, um, I don't know if I um, hope I didn't misunderstand you, that I was not critical of the diagram. But of course, uh -huh. this is the process um, where we are uh, trying to figure this out, right? Um, I guess my point was that um, I don't know where uh, the, the tight culture and the loose culture idea. Oh, right. So maybe I'm trying to say that, uh, um, well, so certainly this would favor loose, they would say that there's some, in general, that there's a loose culture may be preferable if that helps self-organization. But on the other hand, there may be tight cultures, which actually the tightness, you know, is actually helpful for, uh, for, for helping people be self-organized, you know. Right, right. But my point was also bigger than like, uh, self-organization right right uh, so loose culture where there is room for creativity but mm -hmm. there's both risk of instability and unpredictability like you know um, and I had these conversations mm -hmm. with uh, my friends in in Turkey and um, it was very interesting to like um, yeah to discuss these things of course the joy of like freedom Mm -hmm. uh, the joy of experimentation, the joy of adventure, the joy of like knowing and discovering oneself um, in 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 the world, in life, uh, but also the pain of it, you know. Right. <laughs> so, so it's like you know finding your own path. Um, I mean, not really like your own own path, but but it is, I think. Uh, I think it well, is less regulated in terms of culturally and socially, totally. Well, and so uh, self-organization in a certain sense would be self-assistance. So like, I, I can imagine, you know, sociologists looking at different interventions, you know, that assist or maybe hurt a person, keep them, you know, give them bigger obstacles or or remove those obstacles, you know, and what's the consequence, et cetera. Uh, but the point being that um, the next step, uh, at least in comparison with biology, like in biology, you have homeostasis, okay, you can say, can I keep this, you know, tissue alive, let's say, right. But 
as something is able to keep itself alive, it will actually be able to transcend itself, like where it's able to heal itself, or it'll be, you know, if you rip it in half, it'll be able to heal itself and become two different, you know, two different copies of itself, let's say, right? So in the same way, uh, if there's assistance and things are uh, very um, able to deal well with assistance, then that leads to self-assistance, you know, which leads to like organization in a way that uh, supports self-assistance. So um, that's uh, that's probably what I mean here by self-organization, like, you know, where you have, you know, and that may typically be like mutual support. It may be like communitarian. It may be, you know, it may include things like arranged marriage, you know, if that's uh, if that helps people um, be supportive of each other. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, or, or it helps people. I, I can't, you know, I, I'm not an expert on that, but. But um, but at least this gives a frame, like uh, to say, well, there's a way to get objective uh, uh, objective positions in terms of things in general, and then it, and and then that that it all funnels into this notion of self identity, like, well, how do people, you know, how do people themselves look at what they're, you know, how, how these right. things affect them. So I have a question, two questions. Mm -hmm. when, when, so freedom, new constraint, uh, assistance, self-organization, right? So these, you said this is more economic, looking at society from an economic or the individual from an economic perspective. I think these are methods. I just kind of made these up, but I think this is what econom economists would do in, in judging a society, right? Like they would look at uh, external how the external environment is changed and what happens. I see. When, and then, uh, okay, so what do you mean by freedom? Like in your, when you were... Well, what would, what, what would people do if they had no constraints? That shows their values. That's the idea. If you really want to know what people, like just give them total liberty. Now, it's hard to give them total liberty, so give them partial liberty. Give them $100, right? What will they do with it? Or give them, you know, give them a, a, a day off or or give them a new device, right? And then that these are the kinds of things that show, okay, they got more freedom, they got more opportunity. What do they do with it, right? And that somehow that shows what they really value, right? That's very interesting. That's interesting. And, then you and I, think the economic, I think economics does that, really. And so this is a very different than ethnography. This is, a, but I think it's, sure. it's they work... They need to go together, I think. Um, so, so maybe. Uh, the, the, so, do you think in sociology that that is a look that yeah, like? I mean, a, yeah. So, what was the question? Sorry. I mean, are these? Uh, do you see these methods being used in sociology? Like, you know, looking and seeing what's the what's the effect of a constraint, for example, imposed, right? Like something, you know, a new law is uh, introduced. People are prohibited to do something. That'll show, you know. You look at yeah. how they respond. I I could see that. Yes, I I think uh, definitely. Um, I mean, these are all the different ways of like uh, looking at um, the individual, right? The study of mm -hmm. humans. I mean, this this definitely. Um, I personally um, have a, an interdisciplinary approach to. Mm -hmm you know the social world and so mm -hmm. using anthropology sociology political science not so much of economics but uh, you know like rational choice theory for example we're all mm -hmm. whatever we do probably that can explain some of this rct right even cooperation right is like why we cooperate because it's a rational well and so these aren't um these are not explanatory models these are methods for figuring things out so this is not like, like rational choice theory is a explanatory theory. Right. But these are all methodologies. These aren't explanatory anything. So you could use this in favor of rational choice theory, but you could use it against, it would just depend on what the yeah, evidence yeah, is. Yeah, sure, sure. But yeah. I meant, I meant just like, um, um, but, but you're right. Yeah. We are in, 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 in the, this is more the the methodology phase, right? Um, right. Yeah. And so, the, and when you say determine consequences of of what? Well, so if you give 
this is maybe just my shorthand, uh, but to say like, if you give people freedom, what are the consequences? Ah, okay, okay, okay. If you give them a new constraint, what are the consequences? Okay. If you give them assistance, what are the consequences? Uh, if, if they self-organize, you know, what are the consequences? How do they do it? Why do they do it? What happens, right, when they self-organize? Okay. Okay. Um, so this is, this is very, um, I think this is a really good place. I mean, I would never have, I would have probably come up with something else, but, but mm -hmm. now that I see this, right, um, that I see this as a model and uh, now I can, um, uh, for our next meeting, I mm -hmm. can either use this or like, or uh, with my own sort of like model. Mm -hmm. of like how I observe how I go about my research and uh, you know I, and then probably we can come together and integrate the two and see what what comes out of it right I think I think that'd be very that'd be very good like to see how you you know what's your th theory that you actually use in your work yes so and then let's... so that would be that would be the, and then to see like do they connect? You know, is this uh, able to connect with that? Uh, you know, and how how could yours kind of sharpen this, or you know, or or are they? Is there something missing? So, one way to critique this would be to come up with methods that aren't included here. You know, are, are there are there oversights? You know, are there things that are missing here? Um, okay. Yeah. Another would be to you know maybe well we could I could work on this. Yeah, certainly yeah, you could you could be a great help, but like to come up with actual examples let's say you know what is an example of a longitudinal study how does it really work right or what is an example of a comparative study right like so what is really because i just kind of made these up i uh, just kind of uh, guessed them right one of the things that uh, comes up here though so we had talked about uh, in this book social theory a basic toolkit talks about five explanatory concepts and uh, when i was in um, new jersey with you I kind of related it to um, six conceptions. Um, and uh, uh, these are um, what I call conceptions of divisions of everything. So uh, sometimes there'll be like, a, well, it would be like a scopes. Uh, like if you have a question and an answer, let's say a question would be increasing slack, an answer would be decreasing slack. And then the relation, the channel between them could have a scope of everything, anything, something, nothing. So those are very abstract. But basically, there's six points of view. And if you look at something like software engineering, you look at how they model things, sometimes they look in terms of the individual, or sometimes they look at the whole, uh, let's say, society, right? And then there were these like four different, um, I could probably pull that up, uh, the diagram, but uh, there were these four different um, levels, like there's the, you know, what's technologically possible, let's say, what are the business rules, or what are the business processes, and what are the goals? Those are the four levels. Yeah, so yeah. I was able to connect that uh, with those five things uh, and actually say there should be a sixth one. So the five things were that you can explain things in social theory in terms of the individual, in terms of um, the social structure. There's this uh, tension between the two. Uh, and then those channels, like there's like nature, uh, there is a culture, there is action. And then I said, just like there should be these goals, there should be vision, you know, th yeah. there's vision. So if I try to see, like, I think that they kind of fit with these six things here. And so this is what I would say, like, an individual is, um, the concept of the individual is collecting the way that they get documented and the way they get classified by the authorities, right? And so to give a, like, archival approach would kind of, like, give analysis in terms of individual. And so in this book, um, they kind of explain that um, individual analysis is for cases where you have a very uh, well-established game or well-established, you know, uh, social system, and it's about people playing that game or, you know, participating in that social system and who does better, who does worse, or how does it work out. So those would be individual explanations. And so this is kind of like in the middle. A social structure could be like the external thing. So like, you know, you have these mystical intersections of these subgroups, you know, some kind of mystical subgroups and or classes in society. You have actual people in there who have their will and they're related by these social networks. So somehow social structure would be reflected in actual social networks. So those 
you know, the types of social networks you have. So, for example, it seems very clear. Uh, there was an uh, analysis of uh, people living in a ghetto and just explaining that they have very large, broad, uh, well-cultivated networks in the sense where, like, children may be moved from one family to the other. But those relationships are very uh, solid because people are in dire situations and they need to be able to uh, shift resources from one to the other, etc. But if they were more uh, wealthy, then they would want to be more independent, typically. But that's more problematic, you know, because then you have uh, you can't fall back on this uh, security. So that's something that's just visible from the social network. And that's something that's indicating the social uh, structure, how it is. Uh, uh, so that may be that may be actually possibly true. And then a census, I think, would give like document what's the nature. So, you know, what's the actual natural constraints, you know, that they're determining. Whereas surveys are kind of like giving the culture. They're saying, okay, well, how are people responding to different, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, the longitudinal stuff is kind of like talking about the actions. Like, okay, one person's life is different than another person's life. Well, because of the actions they were able to take or not able to take or whatever. Um, but um, the one that's missing would be in terms of these classified individuals saying, hey, if you compare different cultures, let's say if you compare different uh, nations or different um, groups, you know, let's say different professions, well, somebody could have a vision and then they could say, hey, this is something, you know, we could be we could be developing ourselves in this way. We could be organizing ourselves in this way. You know, we could look at the example of somebody else, right? Well, like, so Ukraine, do you want to go with the European Union or do you want to go with Russia, right? And you make a choice. And it's a, that's a matter of a vision. You know, so, what vision do you have? Right. And vision is even at the individual level, like, where do you see, where does one see oneself, like, in five years, in 10 years? Like, what are, right? you know, who said, um, <clears throat> oh, we are what we think. Mm -hmm. uh, or there is a book uh, as you think uh, so it's the the thesis of the book is that uh, and so and so you know maybe the the question is like what kind of studies will you know because i just make all this stuff up you know that doesn't mean it's of course you know so to look at the actual methods and say okay like longitudinal studies what are they really showing right mm -hmm. like so what kind of presumptions are they making about individuals and how are they, the, 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 the hypothesis is that they're looking at individuals in two different ways and they're linking them. But what are the two different ways or maybe there are more ways or maybe there isn't two ways, you know, and then, you know, which of those six would it relate to, et cetera. So that's something if we collected more real examples and you have probably, um, I mean, you, you certainly have a collection of um you know, social examples where like different methods are applied. And so we could rummage through that and start to, you know, if we could collect a hundred examples, this would look different maybe, but we could start with your theory. Yes. So let's do this for next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to meet at the same time? To uh, this is a little bit late for me, um, but uh, uh, we can, we can meet, we early. meet earlier. Some And what day is best for you? Thursday works. Because, um, okay, so Thursdays. Mm -hmm. Okay. 12, 12 p.m. Well, would you prefer like one or? or yeah, uh, one is cool. One works. Okay. So then one o'clock your time, that's eight o'clock my time. Yeah. And uh, what, 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 and on Thursday. Focus on? So well, I think two uh, weeks from now. Two weeks from now, right. And then, yeah. um, so if you could present your, uh, you know, talk about your um, ways that you figure things out, right? Sure. And then, um, so that's good. Another question is, uh, would you like to, would it be, what, what would you think about having more people um, participate in this? I'm fine, totally. You like that? I mean, that's a, that's a positive thing, I think, right? Or, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so the first people I would invite then would be, um, I've reached out to Russian, um, I've reached out to um, exiled Russian in Vilnius, Lithuania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I'm in the countryside. Country. And so I'm. they agreed that I give a talk about uh, these ways of figuring things out at their uh, reform space, uh, co-working 
center. So that's okay. great. And so then maybe that'll be in a month or so. Um, and then um, I'd like to invite them to join us then if they if they're able to, right? Yeah, that would be that would be very nice, of course. Um, it would be good to talk to them and, and see. Them. So, so wh what I'm offering is uh, to say, would they be willing to uh, study sociology and just learn about it to um, try to learn to apply it or to think about it or to develop, you know, to develop our own kind of view of or understanding of sociology? based, first of all, on understanding the ways that sociologists figure things out, being able to draw some conclusions from that, but also uh, to uh, maybe we talked about like having a grammar of sociology, because um, it's interesting, like, what can you know about sociology? And this is kind of interesting. It's kind of critical. It's saying that, you know, most of sociology is really just theory making. It's not really a science. It's more like writing essays, which is not a bad thing, let's say. But but that there is a scientific part of sociology, probably, but you can really get to the science of it if you focus on self-identity. That's the thesis. You know, in, in terms of how do you really get to know somebody's self-identity? Because it's a really tricky question. Um, so I don't know if if that uh, seems a uh, uh, sensible thesis, but I just wanted to add about that, that um, it's, I think, relevant for Russia and Ukraine, certainly, um, because we're trying to reach out to Russians so that they could uh, grow strong enough to reach out to Ukrainians and try to have dialogue. Um, what do you think of that thesis on the centrality of this issue of determining self-identity? I think that is um, uh, the way. So the way I see it is that <clears throat> it's certainly one aspect, mm -hmm. one dimension of what sociologists do. Uh, but sociology is also concerned with macro level. Uh, phenomena such as movements, states, uh, societies. And, um, so, for example, what I'm doing, I'm using um, uh, historical sociology mm -hmm. to study two different nations' struggles, uh, compare them, comparative historical sociology, right? Um, and these so are the Kurds in Turkey and the Pashtuns, Pashtuns in, in Pakistan, Pakistan. yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> classical sociological theorists have used this, right? Uh, um, I think Marx has used uh, compare, uh, historical sociology. Um, uh, who else? Um, I mean, more recently, Tilly and uh, these guys have used it to... Uh, uh, Social scientists have used it to study revolutions. Uh, Teda Skopol, I think they, uh, she did a comparative study of China, France, and Russia, I think. So, uh, so sociology, I think, uh, is not just, uh, I would say, um, focused on, I think, self-identity. I mean, it is certainly one key uh, dimension of, of the well and so this is this is saying that uh, and this may be wrong but this is concluding let's say that that's that the question of determining self-identity like how do you determine self-identity like that is the central way of figuring things out in sociology like really getting a you know like that's the that's the a lens that's the kind of like place where you put your finger on the pulse um and so before that, you know, like you can look at movements in on this side ethnographically, you know, to define it, right? To say, okay, this is a movement, and what is that movement? You know, what are the who are the Pashtuns, right? Or who is this labor union, right? Like you can define it that way. But then what is this movement actually doing? Right? Like, so how are they actually behaving? You know, are they using a peaceful means? Are they using um militant, a violent means? And then how are they responding to um, policies, right? So right. how do they respond to various governments and their policies? 
So, and then all that gets filtered into this idea that, um, uh, this idea that, well, how does that, um, uh, how does the individual absorb all that? And where does the individual kind of like place themselves with regard to that? And then to understand that individual, really, to kind of see, well, that individual is very ambiguous because, you know, there's these multiple layers on which you can understand them. You can understand them in terms of how they're classified or, you know, as some kind of strange manifestation of a spirit that is, you know, participating through various subgroups, you know, which is what sociology is all about. But like, you know, how do you ground that? Well, you're grounding it in the way that the government is classifying people. You're grounding it in the way that individuals are documented. You're grounding it in their actual will as, you know, they demonstrate. But it's this mystical spirit. So the mystical spirit is rooted in people's personal, um, well, their their self-identity, whether it's uh, um, conscious or unconscious or, you know, implicit or explicit or whatever. But that, that that's... That is the, so this is a claim, you know, that that's, this is the method that through which everything has to go through. Uh, and so it would deny that there's anything else, you know, really, in the end, like, you know, if there's nothing, this is what claim, like, if, if it's not about a person kind of like locating themselves within society, then it's not sociological. Or so, so what would be an example where like people's self-identity doesn't matter, you know? I see. That's, that's a very, um, uh, very insightful, um, for lack of probably better words. Uh, but even, but even if, if, um, let's say in, in the existing methodological framework, epistemological mm -hmm. framework, um, there is we don't see this i mean this is what we do as human beings you know like we come up with new ways and new, so new so this is a i mean this is just a preliminary sketch but but you're very i, know, I think yeah. you're very supportive you know um uh or you're not trying to be very critical <laughs> but it's no uh, no, no, no really you're, I, mean, you're very... I, think, I really like what you said that if if um i can't probably uh, say it in the words that you did, that if it is not concerned with locating the individual in society, then it's probably not sociological. That's a really, it's not that I'm just supporting. It makes sense, a lot of sense to me. It's like- Yeah, and and I mean, yeah. so Marx and Weber and Durkheim, uh, they're, they're wonderful thinkers, but like when you actually look, but what do they actually prove, you see? <laughs> It's hard to say they actually proved anything because it's it's really not about proving anything or demonstrating any kind of laws. It's more about just uh, developing concepts for making certain arguments. But that's not really science, I think. That's yeah. um, that's something like so. Uh, and that's fine, you know, and it's it's kind of uses these different methods, but it doesn't really focus on what is scientific about it. I think. Right, but there is also a quantitative analysis entering into sociology. You know, so that probably well, like like even documenting. You know, you can document. You like so all these things. You know, like uh, Marx looked at uh, tables and tables of you know economic statistics, right, in terms of wages and etc. Over time, right. So that's all here, right. But that doesn't really. That's not the heart of the science, right? Like that's uh, that's scientific work but it's not really a scientific achievement let's say you know it's not like you know he discovered the law of gravity you know like so in physics you know you come up with a law that says well see it's it's not like saying like well everything that falls you know you come up with a different explanation for everything you know everything is case by case well then that's not really a science in the sense so see i just you know explaining things case by case and it's not coming up with any general rules that would really tell you uh this is a you know this is a rule that uh, that is 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 uh, incontrovertible you know that always follows that or it's just so I'm I'm claiming you know based on this analysis like those rules would really have to be like in terms of how do you determine self identity like so that you know a simple rule might be like well you have to look at all the different ways people talk about themselves you can't just pick one way right like you have to look at what they tell all the governments right so. 
I don't know. Like, I don't know how to determine a person's self-identity, but but at least I think that there could be scientific scientific discoveries about that. Have you, uh, I'll come to the point. Have you read this book, The Study of Man? No. Who's that by? By Carl Poliani. My, sorry, Michael Poliani. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No. My, Michael Poliani was, uh, was a physicist turned sociologist. Mm-hmm. Distinguished scientist turned sociologist assesses man's personal stake in all enos. And so there are three essays. Uh, these are lectures. One is understanding ourselves, the calling of man, and understanding history. He argues the fact is inseparable from value and that the sciences cannot be saviored, severed from humanities. Mm -hmm. Bringing to his writing the credentials of a man who followed a distinguished career as a scientist and an equally distinguished career as a social scientist, Poliani conveys the passion and sense of responsibility he feels essential to the validity of all knowledge, he, whatever. So this is a good book. Okay. And this is an introduction to his uh, bigger book, Personal Knowledge. Um, and, this, and, and this may relate to the ways that you figure things out. Like this is something I could try to read um, or, you know, at least look at uh, in preparation for your talk when we meet. Yeah. Yeah. So so I like this book. I, I finished this recently. Just very good. Very fascinating book. You know, he's, he's one of the main arguments that he makes is. Is, is the uh, articulate knowledge and the inarticulate knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the articulate being built on the inarticulate that we, you know, um, and and so uh, I just have to revisit the book uh, for my presentation. I mean, this is just one of the 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 books that I would uh, probably like include in my some of my ideas. And then there is uh, the sociological imagination. That is a really good book by Wright Mills. Frank Mills? No, Wright Mills. Uh, he was an American sociologist in the 60s. W-R-I-G-H-T, Mills, M-I-L-L-S. The right Sociology now. of Imagination? No, The Sociological Imagination. Oh, The Sociological Imagination. Very good book. I think it would be really good for us to, for both of us to work, um, uh, you know, develop the climate of sociology, whatever that we're working on, right? Um, I think that, so, so I'm going to, um, so two weeks from now, I'm going to be presenting how I. Yes. And, and know. I'll publish that through Math for Wisdom. And then uh, I think we're, so if we can connect and we'll see, you know, how uh, our understanding of the epistemology of sociology fits together uh, and, and to keep improving that. But um one of the goals, uh, especially for applying it to places like, you know, Russia and Ukraine, um, is uh, this uh, grammar of sociology that we talked about in New Jersey. Like, can we think about concepts? Like, can, can we work on science? So saying that, well, okay, self-identity would be maybe a key concept, but for example, like generations. So uh, there's many things that happen, uh, like in Lithuanian history, where like we were occupied for 125 years by the Tsarist Russia, but every generation of Lithuanians would revolt, and Russia was much stronger, and so we would um, we would uh, lose. But the young people would always see, oh, that the nation is alive, that we need to try to rebel. And so every twenty or thirty years, there'd be another rebellion, until finally, uh, after World War One, uh, Russia and Germany both lost, and our rebellion was successful. We were able to declare independence. So. That notion of a generation sociologically, like that's clearly like a important uh, concept in a grammar of sociology. But a generation can be um, not just uh, biological. So, for example, it could be linguistic in the sense of like for teenagers. Um, I think uh, this is what happened in England. There was this uh, vowel shift that happened in the space of 30 years. You know, people just started pronouncing English entirely differently. This was maybe in the 1500s or 1600s, the great vowel shift. Uh, and how did that happen so quickly? And I think the answer is that uh, 
it happened basically by, you know, teenagers or let's say 12 year olds or that thing where the younger children are uh, a generation younger than the older children. So they are doing something is happening and they are kind of like doing it further or more or whatever. And so each every three years you have a generation. So like in 30 years, you could have 10 generations of teenage culture let's see right that is so, interesting yeah i think i'm making kind of making that up but i think i kind of heard that somewhere but i think it just shows that the concept of generation see that's what you would want in a scientific law you'd want to be able to say well this is you know there's this concept of generation in different contexts it could be defined differently but basically this is how it works and what what can that um you know can we have uh, regularities in sociology and what would they look like Mm. Mm. so we've had a long talk uh this is exciting for me uh this is a very and so my my goal is like um i have this language of wondrous wisdom which yields among other things you know these types of uh, schemas but like they illustrate the building blocks which would include let's say these uh, three cycle you know which is a learning cycle includes these levels like whether what how why includes the pairs of them includes let's say two different ways of looking at things that say opposites coexist all is the same so i'm excited for this but you know how to um be able to take something um like a difficult challenge like to come up with a grammar sociology and how to apply it in a practical case like whether for the pashtun um people yeah. or whether for uh ukraine and russia um or other problems in the world and so um I think that's where we are, and including other people. If you have any final comments, but also if I could ask you if I'd, I'd like to conclude with a prayer, if you could say some kind of prayer, or or I think you, we've done this before, so however however you want sure, to. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a prayer? You can. Well, I think I'd prefer if if you did, but uh, and you don't have to say it. You could just uh, however you want to um, do that uh, to conclude. But any final thoughts you have? Uh, no, my final thoughts um, will be um, that I will reflect on our conversation, mm -hmm. develop my, um, uh, you know, thoughts framework uh, for how I use sociology and my methodology, and I will present uh, on that in our next meeting. And uh, the prayer will be, may we have, uh, may we get the, the power and the strength to to complete this. <laughs> okay, and I support you in that. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so will you uh, share uh, the recording with me? And I will share it and I will post it at Math for Wisdom. Awesome. And, uh, okay, so then I can just look at it there. And so we, I, uh, I invite uh, everyone to like and subscribe and to join us. Uh, join our Math for Wisdom discussion group uh, and then you'll get information on how to join us for this uh, study group in sociology. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you so much, Andreas. It was a pleasure.